So, but this question you should have an idea. So, so far, when we talk about dynamics, what I mean in general, as you see, is things evolving in time. That's what dynamics means. So dynamical systems means studying things that evolve in time. So for game theory and other things like that, we have, you know, payoff functions, um, other things in physics like electromagnetic fields and things, these all have clear time evolution. Right? Even in biology, you have populations that evolve in time. But in, in our universe, in cosmology, it's not so simple. And the reason is the following. So let me ask you, how many dimensions do we live in right now? Not In general, how many dimensions do we live in? Four. So what are those four dimensions? So the claim is that we live in four dimensions, three space, one. But we don't just live in space, and we don't just live in time. We live in space-time, so it's four dimensions. So it's not just space, it's actually called space-time. And this was actually not Einstein's original idea. It was actually due to, if you can believe it, Poincaré again. And related to Poincaré was, does anybody know? And that's not a Greek fellow. He was Minkowski. And then Einstein. Who was Minkowski? Yeah, who was Einstein? And then Einstein kind of took their ideas and put it forward. But the idea is that you cannot separate space and time. They're one entity. So if, if you want to picture our universe as a four-dimensional manifold, then any event in our universe is labeled by four coordinates. x1, x2, x3, and then a time coordinate. So it's space-time. The point is you cannot separate these two. They are on equal That gives you a problem when you're trying to understand dynamics, because then what does it mean for something to evolve in time? You see the problem. So the way you do this, in our universe, we want to understand the dynamics of our entire universe, how it's evolving. It's a problem because it's space-time. So how do you talk about something evolving in time? Well, what you do is, and I'm skipping about two months of generative lecture here, but what you do is you take your four-dimensional universe, and you apply what is called a foliage. And what this foliation does is, it takes four dimensions and splits it into three plus one. And so three spatial coordinates and one time. So in other words, you take your four dimensional structure and you break it up with the preferred timeline structure. I won't put this up here. And you have a bunch of three dimensional slices that you are evolving in time. So this would be a three-dimensional slice at time t is equal to zero, t is equal to one, t is equal to four. So now your dynamics of the universe are about three-dimensional surfaces evolving in time. And this is because of this three plus one split. So in here, this is governed by the Einstein field equations which you don't have to know, I'm just writing it for completeness. And the main point is that on the left side of these equations, you have curvature terms. And on the right side, this TAB is a matter. So the idea is that you have matter in the universe, like physical matter, like radiation, dust, etc that induces curvature in the space-time. In the 3 plus 1 picture, you have curvature that's evolving in time. So that's how you talk about dynamics. So, but this is, these are four-dimensional equations. How do these translate over to a dynamical model? So the idea is to, to 
jet dynamics. There are many ways. This is not a unique way to go from this picture to this picture. It's a convenient way to do it. To get dynamics, what you use is something called the orthonormal frame. Form. And I will not also go into this in too much detail because I don't want people to start throwing things at me. Just throw it away. But the idea behind this is that if you assume that on large scales, the universe is what we call spatially homogeneous. And I'll explain what this means in a second. Then the Einstein field equations can be written as a nonlinear system of first order ordinary differentiation, a dynamic. Does anybody know what I mean by spatially homogeneous? Yes. And everything looks the same on the area? Almost. So it's isotropic. What do I mean by homogeneous? So I mean, that's a good point. So when I say something is spatially homogeneous, I mean that it's translationally invariant. So if I have something like this, like a circle or a sphere, and I take two points, and I move the two points, the sphere still stays the same. So I can translate, so this is invariant with respect to spatial transition. So on our largest scales, our universe is invariant with respect to spatial transition. It's homogeneous, and it's isotropic as well, but that's for another day. Okay, so the main point is the following. You can take these tensor equations that are actually 10 nonlinear, coupled, hyperbolic, partial differential equations that have no solution whatsoever. And you can reduce them to a dynamical system if you assume that the universe is spatially homogeneous on large scales. Because you see, if I tell you that the only thing that's evolving is time, that's what it means to be spatially homogeneous. Nothing is changing in space, it's only changing time. Yes, two questions. First okay. one. Um, did Einstein actually do, do this equation himself? Yes. After like 10 years. 10 years? 10, 1905 to 1960. So then he, he didn't know how to solve this, but he interpreted it? So there's a, there's a funny joke behind this. Um, Einstein, in the process of 10 years of deriving these equations, spent many years going to talks where he was giving people kind of previews of what he was trying to do. And in one of his latest talks uh, around the 1915 mark, David Hilbert was sitting in the audience. Hilbert figured out what Einstein was getting at. And Einstein knew that Hilbert knew what he was going to do. So he rushed from, and they had a race between the two of them, actually. Hilbert figured out what Einstein was trying to do in 10 years in one hour. That's how smart David Hilbert was. So he figured out these equations. They are his equations. But then he concluded in this paper, except for the most trivial cases, these equations cannot be solved. Lo and behold, two years later, Schwarzschild comes up with a solution of these equations. So they're extremely complicated to solve. But you can do this, and you can get a dynamic system. Second question. Yes. So you said uh, uh, for the uh, sphere one, you have two points in the middle of there, the same? The sphere so doesn't change. change. So uh, what, is, what is that just for reality? Universe is on the largest scale. If you see a picture of the cosmic microwave background, for example, you can take any two points in the night sky, but the universe doesn't change its structure with respect to rotations or translations of those points. That's so. So our universe is a very geometrically special. Okay, so but what are these equations? 
So, when you apply this formula, as I said, the field equations become a dynamic. So you get three. The first equation has a special name for it because it was derived by the Indian physicist for a change. His name was Ray Chaudhary. And his equation is called Ray Chaudhary's equation. And I'm not saying this because I'm obviously biased. I'm just saying that it is actually the most important equation in cosmology. I will say that. Okay. There are many non-Indians that will agree with me on this. Okay, and it goes like this. So you get theta prime. I'll explain what these variables are. So prime means d by dt, as usual, okay? Is equal to minus one third theta squared minus one half mu plus dt plus capital R. I'll explain these in a second. I just want to write down the equation. So you get Ray Chaudhary's equation. You get what is known as the Friedman equation. Or constraint. And that looks like the following. So one third theta squared is equal to minus one half capital R plus mu plus lambda, you get an energy conservation equation And then you get the longest of the equations, which is the curvature evolution equation. R prime is equal to what? 4 ninths theta cubed plus 2 thirds mu plus 3 t minus 4 thirds theta lambda minus 2 is theta mu plus k, and that's it. So you have three dynamic equations, just like we have for our other system, and one constraint. Now, what are all these things? I have no idea, I just made them. I'm joking. Okay. But the point is, as you can see, using some formulas on which I'm asking you to take my word for, or you can look up the paper, it's very convenient. You can reduce these tensor PDs to a bunch of ordinary dimensions. Just like we had for everything else we can think. Now what in the world are these symbols? I will tell you. Theta is what we call an expansion scalar. It tells you how the universe expands or contracts. If the universe can expand, it certainly can contract itself. That's what theta is. So Ray Chaudhary's equation tells you the dynamics of the expansion rate or contraction rate of the universe. Mu is the energy density of matter in your universe. E is the pressure, so the matter of pressure. What else? R is the three-dimensional curvature of the spatial slices I drew before. And it evolves in time. So you have an R prime equation as well. And then lambda is known as the cosmological constant. It is one of the fundamental 
constants of nature, of our universe. Does anybody know what it is, the number? No. You don't have an idea? It's not five. It's actually a very small number. It's 10 to the minus 122. About. The cosmological constant represents what we call dark energy. Well, that's the belief in it. And dark energy is responsible for the accelerated expansion. Yes. So Einstein. Right. So uh, Einstein. So this lambda here, this capital lambda, is responsible for the accelerated expansion of the universe, the dark energy. Einstein introduced it into his equations by accident. I thought it was a mistake at first. But then it was later on discovered that actually you need this. So it was his biggest blunder, as he said, but the most useful one. So is that clear so far? So one covers the expansion of the universe. You have things that talk about the matter and pressure of the universe. R is the curvature, and lambda is the cosmology. Okay. So but as we've been doing with everything else, we have a constraint. So I can use the constraint to eliminate one of the variables. It's the same thing. There's nothing. Actually, this is, in some sense, more easy to deal with than the biological systems because. As of now, as you'll see, we only really have one free parameter. In the SRS model, we have like seven of no different. But it's much easier. So let me do that. And there's a hidden surprise when you use a dynamical system method like this, and I'll show you. So, can anybody quickly look? I erased the theta prime equation now. But just like in dynamical systems, I need one equation for every variable to have a closed system, right? I have not accounted for one variable. I'm missing one equation. Can anybody tell me what it is? Look carefully. Do I have an equation for theta? Do I have an equation for mu? Do I have an equation for r? Lambda is a constant, so whatever. What am I missing? Pressure. How do I take care of that? Any, any fluid mechanics people in here? <coughs> you know? From atmosphere? No? No, I don't. Does anybody have an idea? How I can talk about pressure? I'm missing pressure. No. Okay. So. There's an assumption, <coughs> which is actually a pretty good assumption. We can assume that the matter in the universe is what we call barotropic. That means that the pressure is proportional to the energy. And this, how do I change a proportionality to an equation? I have to introduce what? Constant, right. So to fix this, I will assume that P, which is the pressure, is given by some constant W. And that will allow me to close the equation. And in particular, what is this W? We call it an equation of state. And if you take courses in fluid mechanics, you will see this. Equation of state pressure. And this W, which is a dimensionless number, describes the type of matter you could have in the universe. In particular, we assume that W strictly is between minus 1 and 1. And there are some examples of what values of W can be. So, In particular, so some examples. If W is equal to zero, that means your universe is filled with dust. Just straight up cosmic dust. If W is equal to minus one, this means you have a second cosmological constant. 
consumption, which is quite possible. If W is equal to one third, it means your universe is filled with radiation. There are some more exotic states. Um, if W is equal to minus one third, these are what you call cosmic strings. And the most extreme case on the other end is that W is equal to 1. This is what we call a Zeldovich fluid or a stiff fluid. So this is valid at very early times. So now we have accounted for, and this is the only free parameter that will show up in our vision, this W. So now we have accounted for all the variables. Now I will use the constraints to eliminate non equation. This is all fluid mechanics theory. As I said, I'm skipping about three textbooks worth of courses for this 30 minute <laughs> um, but it's okay. We want to understand using what we know. So, so I will now use the Friedman equation to eliminate mu. Just by choice. I don't like you, I will do it. And as a result, you get two equations. So the Rachel's equation becomes the following one fourth minus r minus three r w minus two theta squared minus two w theta squared plus six lambda plus six w lambda. And the R prime equation is so simple, it's laughable actually. And you don't expect it actually. Watch how simple it is. It's minus two thirds of R theta. Yeah. It's such a surprise when you derive it, and this just comes up as one term. So just like our other examples, the entire evolution of the universe on the largest scales comes down to two ordinary differences. I skipped a lot of stuff, obviously, but this is the answer that we're interested in. Any questions so far? Oh, so that's our dynamical system, and it has one free parameter, which is the W. So you can tell now stability will depend on what W is. And I should make this point that you can have mixes of these two. So you can have intermediary states like four thirds, which is like radiation plus dust or something like that. So you can have mixes of these. Okay, so that's our dynamical system. So now what is the first step when we begin? Because I don't believe that these can be solved. I tried it, not doesn't work. So what is the first step? Extremely simple to find the equation. So let's see what else. 
And I claim there are three equilibrium functions. And this is the surprise about this method. So when I told you before that the Einstein equations are impossible to find a close form solution for, it turns out actually, unlike our previous example, the equilibrium point actually means something very significant to this dynamic. And in fact, the surprise is that the equilibrium points are solutions to the Einstein equation. They just aren't random points like in biology and game theory and stuff. They actually are solutions to this theory. So in some sense, there are new ways to find solutions to Einstein equation using this orthonormal frame formalism. So what are they? So one equilibrium point, so I'll call this equilibrium point one, or just P1 maybe for short. So as I said, the simplest thing to do is to just set in turn theta to zero and one to zero and see what happens. So if you set theta to zero, so remember I'll call it theta star or star. So set theta to zero, and then you solve the R equation, what do you get? You get 6 lambda plus w lambda over 1 plus 3. So. Now, let me ask you, what is significant about this solution? What does it mean to have theta equal to 0? R is constant. Sorry? R is constant. No, theta is equal to 0. Exactly. That's the key point. And so if it's something is not expanding or contracting, what is it by definition? Static. Static, Static that's right. Very good. <laughs> so theta is equal to zero. Remember, theta is the rate of expansion and scalar. So if it's not expanding, it's static. So the first set of equilibrium points represent static equilibrium. And now, it depends on the sign of R, how you subclass these static numbers. So let me ask you a geometry question. If I have something that is spatially homogeneous, and actually I also made another assumption, which Spiros alluded to, but I actually didn't admit it at the time. Not only am I assuming Spatial invariance. But I'm also assuming rotational invariance. So, if I have some shape, easy geometry question. If I have some shape and it's invariant with respect to spatial translation and spatial rotation, what are the only three possible geometries I can? Sphere is one of them. In three dimensions. Uh, so, what are the only possible three dimensional geometries that you can have? Sphere is one. Planar is another. Hyperbolic. Perfect. Why did you say hyperbolic? Okay. <laughs> right. There's only three possibilities. You can have a sphere or spherical geometry. You can have a hyperbolic geometry, which is like a saddle. Do not get confused, I don't mean the same hyperbolic as equilibrium. Or you can have a planar here. Only three possibilities. In the first case now, is the curvature positive, negative, or zero? For a sphere. Positive. So R would be greater. For a hyperbola or a saddle, is my curvature negative, positive, or zero? And for plane, is it flat? Yes, it's both. So not only 
do the first set of equilibrium point filters and static universes, but they have a subclass now depending on the sign of this. So, for point one, if R star is greater than zero, these are static spherical universes. If R star is less than zero, these are static hyperbolic universes or negatively curved universes. And if R star is equal to zero, you have static flat universes or just plain old Minkowski space time of special static and flat. Now, what is the only free parameter in R star? W. And W goes between minus one and one. So depending on the sign of that or the sign of W, we will have these types of so let's see what we have. And in fact, the case where R star is greater than zero and it's static, this has a special name. It's called the Einstein static. It's actually one of the first solutions he found. Yes? Static and flat, if you can imagine. I meant to say flat. No. Sorry. Lost my interest in writing. Okay. So let's see. Let's analyze this equilibrium point and see what we have. But in general, the first equilibrium point represents classes of static universes. Because no matter what theta is equal to zero. So if R star, I'll just write up R star is equal to 6 lambda plus w lambda over 1 plus 3 is 0. What is the only way r star can be less than 0? As you can do the analysis, it means that 6 lambda plus w lambda over 1 plus 3 w must be less than 0. Now, as I said, lambda is just a constant. It's positive, 10 to the minus 1, 2. But it's a positive number. And w goes between minus 1 and 1. So the only way this can be negative, as you can show, is if w is strictly between minus 1 thirds and 1. So for any matter where w is minus 1 thirds strictly less than and up to 1, you'll have r squared less than zero. Uh, greater than 2. Sorry, I'm doing this close to it. So there will always be an Einstein static universe equilibrium point if w is between minus 1 thirds. Is that because the top doesn't matter at all because it's just one number? So you're facing a one between one number? Essentially, yes. But you can just do the algebra of the inequality. Oh, question. Uh, yes, yes, so I, I was doing the closed case, but I wrote the wrong sign. Okay. Now, the second case, R star less than zero. So, when do we have static hyperbolic universes? Is when 6 lambda plus w lambda, 1 plus 3 w is less than zero. And this is kind of more or less the opposite. Right? So, in this way, this will only happen when w is strictly between minus 1 and minus 1. You'll get that. And the final case, you'll have a Minkowski or a flat universe. Is what? See it? Did you see it? Did you see it? Oh, okay. And r star is equal to 0 if this is equal to 0. And that will only happen in the extreme case when w is minus 1. What? Did you did say yeah. That's it. <laughs> this is a minus 1, not a minus 1, and ball. Well, perhaps the w is equal to minus 1 third. Ah, oh, you have singularities. But I do not want to talk about this at this point. Because I can feel the tension in this room right now. I do not want to. 
Actually, it's a very important case, but you brought up, you see the curvature blows up, goes to infinity. So that's an example of a cosmological singularity. We talked about that. Okay, but is everybody clear on this? So it's the same thing. It's actually easier than the biology example. I have my dynamical system, I found the equilibrium point, and now I just look at the sign to see what I have. And the sign depends on the parameters. Okay, that's the first set of equilibrium. In one minute, I think I can tell you the second set. Because really, there's one equilibrium. So these set of equilibrium points happen when I set theta to zero. Let me do the other one, now set r to zero. So equilibrium point. No, I have to do it now. I was going to do it, I thought I'd have time, but I did not. Probably if you ask some questions. No, I'm just, I, I thought I'd have time. Okay, so now we will set R to zero. And what does it mean if I'm starting only with solutions of R to zero? What type of points are these? So, uh, I've not set theta to zero, just set R to zero. So they're flat. So these are flat numbers. To be proper, I should say spatially flat. Because I criticize other people when they do not put spatially, so I should switch. And what happens is you get the following equilibrium point. Theta star, r star. If you set r to zero in that equation, and you solve for theta, you get the following. Very easy. Square root of 3, square root of 1, and theta is and actually, we can write down the second one as well, because it's just the minus of this. So, so there's three equilibrium points in total. The Einstein static universes and these flat universes. And these are also solutions to the field equations as well. In fact, these are what we call decidual. And now you see theta is not zero, it has a number. If it's plus, so, theta is equal to plus square root of 3 square root of lambda. These are expanding. I'll just put ds for this here. And obviously, if theta is equal to minus root 3 root of lambda, these are contracting. And I literally mean this. So, if you have two observers in these universes that are moving in this universe. When I say they're expanding, I literally mean they're expanding apart. So one goes like that, and one goes like that. And the rate of this divergence is what you call theta. But you can go the other way too. So you can start, if the universe is contracting, as these observers are moving along these lines, they will eventually reach the same. One second, I'll get you. So, these are the three equilibrium points. Now, which I must say for Wednesday, what is now the next step? So, we will now analyze now, based on the eigenvalue, which of these points are stable, unstable. Any questions? It's the same thing. But this is much, much more interesting than anything biology does. Okay. I know. <laughs> I've given up trying to edit in my daughter.
plus 6 number, plus 6 doesn't matter. And we had the R dot prime equation, which is minus 2 thirds R six after a bunch of things. Then I found three equilibrium points. So the first equilibrium point corresponded to the case where uh, theta star was zero. And we saw that that meant these are static universes that do not expand with the So we have a static solution. And they were in general given by theta star r star is equal to zero, six lambda plus w lambda, one plus and then I broke down cases for you where r would be less than greater than or equal to zero. And the important case was when r, r is greater than zero. And these were the so-called Einstein static universes. And so forth for the other cases. And then I found two more equilibrium points with which are just conjugates of each other, the so-called Fisinger universe. And these were so equilibrium points two and three. And one was theta star r star. So these correspond to cases where r star is equal to zero. These are spatially flat universes. Because the curvature, which is r, is zero. So these are flat. Okay. And in particular, we had plus square root of 3, square root of lambda 0, and then we had theta star r star, which is minus square root of 3, square root of lambda. So that's where I left you off. And this solution, because it's plus, theta is plus, is an expanding universe, which is the expanding consider. And this is minus, so theta is minus, it's contracting, you have a contracting decision. So this is what they were working out in that situation, but in a much more difficult direction. I can show you that. The dynamical system is very beautiful because it allows you to do things that otherwise would be very difficult to do. Because we can get, I'm not actually solved the equation. You see, with the nonlinear systems, all the nonlinear systems that we've done, I don't even care about solving them because I can get so much information from equilibrium points and eigenvalues and things like this. I can sketch the entire solution without actually having to solve the equation. So that's why I left you off last time, and today we will do the stability analysis. So, I can slash stability. So, the first thing to do is to set up your Jacobian matrix. And the quickest way to do this is to call one F1 and to call the other one F2, as I've been doing. Eventually, you won't need to do that, but just to keep track, it's easier to do it like this. So then your Jacobian matrix is simply given by partial F1, partial theta, partial F1, partial R, partial F2, theta, partial F2, partial R. And now you just compute as usual partial derivatives. So, in general, you get the following. Minus theta, 1 plus W, you get 1 fourth, minus 1, minus 3 W, you get minus 2 R over 3, and minus 2. Everybody clear so far? So it's the same thing as usual, just computing partial derivatives. So now 
I want to, that's my Jacobian in general. I would like to determine eigenvalues related to each point, as usual. Okay. So let's do it. So what happens? We must substitute our equilibrium point, as usual, into our Jacobian region, and then we will compute the other. So, uh, I guess I should call this point one, and then this should be point two, and this should be point three, just to be. So, at point one, where theta is equal to zero, and R is this wonderful looking number, we have the following, that the Jacobian, if you just substitute it, it becomes the whole. You get zero, you get one fourth minus one minus three w, minus four, one plus w is lambda, one plus three w, and two. Straight substitution. Question? Oh. Okay. So you get two zeros. And now you just compute the eigenvalue. Which is a trivial thing to do. Well, trivial if you have nothing. Lambda 1, you find, is minus. So I've given you three types of these questions on your review sheet. All two by two systems, and it will give you practice on computing eigenvalues. So minus square root of 1 plus w, square root of lambda, and the other eigenvalue you get is square root of 1 plus w. Now, um, so, is this a source, sink, or salvage? Why is it such? Very good. So this is always going to be negative, because these quantities are positive, and this is always going to be positive. And moreover, why and are they always going to be positive? is because I'm assuming W can be between minus one, if you remember our assumption. Now, there are some interesting, uh, maybe there's not enough physicists in this room, so you will not respect this idea, but there are some physicists that have taken this idea that what if you have a negative cosmological constant, and you get complex eigenvalues here. You get all sorts of weird dynamics, actually. So there are some interesting ideas behind this, but we can talk about it later. But for our purposes, as I said last time, we are assuming that lambda is roughly this very, very small positive number. And w is between minus one and one. So you're right. So therefore, because lambda one is less than zero, which is not true, this is a sign. So therefore, what we can say So therefore, for this model, which are my Especially homogeneous and isotropic solutions. If you remember, that was the assumption we made the sphere, the hyperbola, and the plane. Yes? We do consider the least weak. No, sorry. Um, that is a complication that we do not want for this case. Because there's some deep physics involved in why that is. So I'm saving you from the question. So, therefore, for this model, all of the static solutions are satisfied. Now, 
will ask you this because I will ask you on the exam. So as I asked you on the view sheet, what is the dimension of the stable manifold? Of the stable manifold. Very good. So a quick way to write this, if you remember, we denoted our manifold by W as W U W. If you go back to your notes, so a quick way to write this is dim WS. Dimension of stable manifold. What is the dimension of the unstable manifold? One. Very good. W, U. And what is the dimension of the center manifold? There's no center. And that's real special. I do not want to deal with center manifold. I'll show you why in five minutes. It's very complicated. Okay. And of course, dim of W, C. And what does this mean? It's a nice thing to impress your friends with, but what does it mean? There's a dimension. You have essentially two manifolds here. It means the following. It means you have, because you have a one-dimensional stable manifold, or you have a stable manifold to begin with, that means there are some orbit slash solution that are attracted. Also, correspondingly, an unstable manifold, there are also some solutions that are repelled by this one. So, that is the significance of this. In the neighborhood of the point, because remember, we define manifolds in the neighborhood of a region. So, that's what it means to have a stable and an unstable. Any questions? So that's for one of the equilibrium points. What about my considered universe? What? And I just realized I erased my Jacobian. <laughs> oh no. Okay. That's okay. I can just ask you to recall it. So I point to which was theta star. Mm -hmm. R star is equal to square root of 3. Square root of lambda, zero. The Jacobian, as you can confirm, takes the following point, or form. Namely, you get minus root square root of three, one plus w, square root of lambda. This stays the same. You get zero here. You get minus two square root of lambda over And what are the eigenvalues? You get two as you expect. You get lambda one is minus two square root of lambda square root of three. And you get that lambda two is equal to minus square root of three one plus two. Square root of three. Okay. Is this a sink source value or something else? Why is it a sink source? Two names. Just two names. Right. So, clearly, lambda 1 is always a star. There it is. And lambda 2 will also be always less than 0. If minus 1 is less than w, which is less than infinity 1. Even if w is equal to minus 1, which is the special case here, and then therefore lambda 2 is equal to 0. Remember I said, as long as only one of eigenvalues is 0, you can always look at the signs of the other ones to determine the position. So even if w is equal to minus 1, this will still always be negative. So it's still a thing. But lambda 1 is still less than 0, so this is still. So, what does that mean? So, 
now, the third step is to identify the manifold dimension. So, what is the dimension of the unstable manifold? Zero. Zero. What is the dimension of the stable manifold? Two. And what is the dimension of the central manifold? So it's purely attracting. Um, this point is asymptotically stable. As long as W does not equal minus 1, because both eigenvalues have to be done. Since lambda 1 is less than 0, lambda 2. As long as W does not equal. So there's two ways to determine asymptotic stability. We have to know stability in this one. And all you're required to show is that both or all of your eigenvalues are strictly less than zero. Any questions? So it's interesting. We have a bunch of static universe possibilities that are saddled. And we have this expanding state that is asymptotically stable, it's a single one. Interesting. I wonder what would happen if you look at the final at the contracting decision. Let's see. As you can imagine, I don't really need to do the computations over. Why is this? I just have to put in minus sign. So just switch the sign. Because you see the calculation is invariant with respect to a minus sign. Because the other point is just minus root 3 or plus root 3. So if I put a minus here, it will cost me a plus sign. Okay. And then therefore I'll get 2 plus eigenvalues. So this should be point 3. I just want to be Out of sheer value. So, is this a sink source or sub? It's a source. Is it a Um, Not always, but in this case it turns out to be the same. This is a sink Hence, it is unstable. And now I will ask you again what is the dimension of the stable manifold? What is the dimension of the center manifold? And what is the dimension of the unstable manifold? So therefore, because this equilibrium point only has associated to it an unstable manifold, it is repelled. It repels all of it. Therefore, repelled. Very good. So this is the first system which we've done, which has a sink, a source, and a sub. But for all values of W, no matter what you choose W to be, you'll always have that the saddle universes will be a saddle, and you'll always have the contracting universe 
as a source, and you always have their expanding universality. So what do we actually have in other discoveries? A very cool thing has emerged from this analysis. We have something that connects a thing, a source, and a person. What is that called? Does anybody remember? If I have, in sequence, a source, a saddle, and a thing, Hallucinic orbit or hallucinic sequence? Sequence. Very true. Very true. I think so. Uh, I should erase. I, I, I forgot what order. So I should erase the second one. So I should erase the first one. This happens to me a lot, actually. A lot of students got angry at me in my first year class. So they wrote all this stuff down. And then I had a habit of, I guess, absent-mindedly talking to students during the class. And then I went back and erased what I just wrote. And they were not happy about it. Yeah. That's the same. Oh. So, irrespective of what W is, the point one is always a saddle. Point two is always a sink. And point three is always a source. In other words, what this implies is that you have a heteroclinic That connects, remember, so what is the definition of a heteroclinic sequence? I kind of just told you. Well, the source and some shadow side. Right. So the source goes to a shadow. Or maybe you have more than one shadow. As long as you start with the source, you have a bunch of shadows in between. Them. And that's interesting. So I'll explain the significance of this in a second, but now I. Yeah, I kind of do. So, let's do something. So as I said, it, for you, I wrote this up kind of quickly in the car. Well, I, I was not right. <laughs> I was in the And uh, so to do these numerical solutions, um, you have to pick a value for the value. So I just picked, just to start with, Let's just do one third, which corresponds to a universal radiation, if you remember. So let me take that. And then I got to also draw these equilibrium points as well. Maple is not this. And then I will. So that's what the base force is. And just to keep it in context, so the different equilibrium points are there. Maybe blue was not as you could, but you can kind of see. So what are the individual points here? So red, just to keep a legend. I forgot the code to actually add a legend to the figure, so I'm writing it by now. The red point is this one. Um, I think I wrote blue is the second point here, which is the same. And green. That's what I'm going to talk about. So, as you can see, you can clearly see that the red is a saddle point. You have some that are attracting it, some that are repelling it. You can see blue is very clearly a sink of the system. Mathematica is very weird with some of its orientations of curves, so pretend it's not there. But as long as you <laughs> notice the, um, the sink and source behavior, green is clearly a source of the system, blue is clearly a source. So if you have these, and look, they're on polar opposites of the phase portion as well, just like we expected to the function behavior as well. So you definitely have in this system, you 
have expanding universes that are a future state of the universe, starting from some generic contracting states. And you see there's orbits that connect all three points. If it was drawn a lot better, but you can clearly see it. I had not been a secret thing of this. So we can talk about that in two minutes. Because I, I don't want to give you the impression that they're different universes, actually. They're states of one universe. So let's talk about that. And I'm not actually, I should make this point. What is the next step I always do after I finish analyzing the eigenvalues? Even on your review sheet, what is the next thing I have? The fourth thing. Such that the bias. I cannot do that for this model. And that's Liam's why I didn't want to do lambda is equal to zero. If you set lambda is equal to zero, you get only center run. You get no stable or unstable numbers. All your eigenvalues are different. So this is actually leads to what we know as Vitali bifurcation. And they cannot be determined by looking at the chip of memory. That's why it's called Vitali. So usually what we've done is we've linearized the system and then we've seen where the Jacobian is equal to zero. In some very highly nonlinear dynamical systems, cannot do that because the Jacobian is useless. When you set certain parameters to zero, you just get a bunch of zeros. So cannot be determined by Jacobian. But they still are there, and this system in particular has a very specific type of bifurcation, and it's called something. These are called the following. The type of bifurcation you get is what is known as the Zaldana Tuckian degenerate bifurcation. And I will spare you the detail, I will simply ask you to. It's too complicated to cover in this class because it relies on being in what we call center mapping. So if you want to look it up, out of shameless self-promotion once again, you can look it up in archive, and it's 1607.02. Very interesting behavior happens actually in the bifurcation, but it cannot be determined by a linearization. So what does this mean? I keep calling these equilibrium points universes, but I don't actually mean they are different universes. We still only have one universe. In any dynamical system, though, what do the equilibrium points represent? They represent different states of the system. So this represents different states of one universe as well. Right? It's not that there are different state, they're different models. So we have three equilibrium points, which means that this universe at least under the assumption of the geometry that we are dealing with, the homogeneity, has three distinct states in its evolution. In particular, so it started off in this contracting space, contracting to what? Big Bang. at t is equal to zero, let's say. Then for some interesting thing that we don't understand why, it hit this saddle behavior, which was our static universe. And then somehow we ended up where we are today, which is the expanding space. So our universe is expanding. Precisely like that. So our universe has three different epochs in it. Our contracting epoch that goes to the Big Bang. There's some saddle behavior intermediary 
and then our final expanding state. And that's where we are now. Um, I, I don't. That's the other key thing. So, um, how we got the Einstein field equation, how I wrote down the dynamical system, if you remember, I made a bunch of assumptions. The two assumptions I made was that, in general, the model I'm dealing with is spatially homogeneous. And I suppose. But this behavior depends upon the geometry I assume to start with. It's very specific. I assume that the space-time is homogeneous and isotropic. If I drop one of those assumptions, I get a broader range of equations that have more equilibrium points, at least 10, 8, 9. Each one of them has different degrees of equilibrium. In some of these assumptions, if you drop isotropy, for example, you don't get that the saddle is intermediary. Maybe you get that a static universe is the final state. So this, these equilibrium points crucially depend on the assumptions you make. And that's very tricky because nobody knows precisely what the configuration of, was of the very early universe. So I've assumed in some sense that the early universe in my model, or Friedman's model, um, are very clean to be in. But it's not obvious. Ah, but I have data to prove what I do. Oh, he's trying to clarify it. <laughs> no. Uh, well, I mean, there's some justification for four um, And what is our justification? It's the. This region. See, if you look at a radiation map of the night sky, which is a cosmic wave. roughly at this picture, at very large scale, there is homogeneity and isotropy up to a very high percentage. So there is some justification, a very strong justification actually. And plus, we know that the universe is expanding, that's confirmed. <coughs> so there is justification. But as I said, if you drop one of these assumptions, the equations become much more complicated. And in some sense, it must be the case because the early universe you expect to be chaotic and all these types of things. So it's not necessarily a good assumption to assume it's very clean. But that we can talk about. Any, any questions on anything about this? Not, not whatsoever. So if I gave you Einstein's equations, you could solve this. No problem. So expect it on the last question. No, maybe not. Why not? You can do it. I've, you've done this. Why can't you? You can write down what you did in your previous session. Really? No, I want you to do that. But it's good practice. <laughs> it's very good practice. Can you say I'm crazy? <laughs> I can say it. But now I'm being accused of it. I'm nearly being a bird. Anyway, so I just wanted to say, um, You've been a very good class. Um, I thank you for putting up with me and all my <laughs> laziness and jokes. Um, but if you ever need anything in the future, please do not hesitate to email me or contact me or whatever. Um, it was very good. Thank you.